Hello, I'm Murray Biggs, welcoming you to Actors at Work. What you're about to watch is a public rehearsal of a short scene from a play, Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors. My two actors are currently in the third and final year of the acting track of the Yale School of Drama, our professional theatre training program. They'll begin by giving you a short context for the scene before running it through once, script in hand. I'll then comment on what we've seen from the back of the room. Maybe there'll be some three-way exchange. Then they'll do it again, or bits of it again, in light of my remarks, before we take a break for questions or observations from any of you. Finally, we'll wrap up the hour with the whole scene again, as best as our actors can manage it. In this way, we hope you'll get an idea in miniature of what happens between actors and a director in bringing any play from the page to a public performance. Let's get started. Hello. Howdy. Um, so I guess we're supposed to give you some context. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, I will be playing uh, Luciana. And Luciana's sister, Adriana, um, will be behind that door, imaginatively. <laughs> um, uh, we are coming in from the house uh, where, mistakenly, we think that this is her husband. Now, the reason that we think that this is her husband is because uh, he is her husband's twin. Twin, separated at birth. Uh, this is from a play, Comedy of Errors. Um, uh, me and my brother separated at birth. I happened to travel to the land where he has set up shop. Uh, and uh, I've been mistaken by the town and most uh, recently by his wife to be him, um, Antipholus of Ephesus. So she's taken me into the house and convinced me that um, I am her husband. And uh, in the meantime, I've, I've got eyes for another woman in the house. Uh, and uh, we're going to see what happens. <laughs> Maybe we could just add that the most remarkable coincidence of all is that you have the same first name. Yes. Antipholus. And twin brother. Uh, so when you are called Antipholus, it's no surprise. Right, that's, that's my name. <laughs> and yeah. maybe we should add that your, uh, your supposed wife, Adriana, has been giving you a very hard time for being gone from the house rather more than she likes. It's true. Where are you, where are you, Murray? I can't see where you are. Yeah, I'm I'm up here. Okay. Ah. Okay, great. Wait. Never mind. The voice will pierce the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's over to you. Let's have a first round of the scene. Thank okay. you. And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office. Shall Antipholus, even in the spring of love, thy love springs rot? Shall love in building grow so ruinous? If you did wed my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth's sake use her with more kindness. Or if you like another, do it by stealth. Muffle your false love in, in, with some show of blindness. Let not my sister read it in your eye. Let not your tongue be your, thy own shame's orator. Look sweet. Be fair. I, Become uh, disloyalty. Apparel vice like virtue's harbinger. Teach sin the carriage of a holy saint. Ah, I, be secret false. What need she be acquainted? <laughs> Alas, poor women. Make us but believe, being compact of credit, that you love us. Though the arm, though others have the arm, show us the sleeve. We, in your motion, turn, and you may move us. <laughs> Therefore, good brother, uh, get you in again. Comfort my sister, cheer her, call her wife. It is holy sport to be a little vain when the sweet breath of flattery conquers strife. Sweet mistress, what thy name is else I know not. 
nor by what wonder you do hit of mine. Less in your knowledge and your grace you show not than our earth's wonder, more than earth divine. Teach me, dear creature, how to think and speak. Lay open to my earthly gross conceit, smothered in errors, it's feeble, shallow, weak, the folded meaning in thy words deceit. Against my soul's pure truth, why well, labor you to make it wander in an unknown field? Are you a god? Would you create me new? Transform me then, and to your power I will yield. But if that I am I, then well I know your weeping sister is no wife of mine nor to her bed no homage do I owe. Far more, far more to you do I decline. O oh, train me not, sweet mermaid, with thy note to drown me in thy sister's flood of tears. Sing, siren, for thyself, and I will dote. Spread o'er the silver waves thy golden hairs, and as a bed I'll take them there, and lie, and in that glorious supposition, think he gains by death that hath such means to die. What are you mad that you do reason thus? Not mad, but, but made it. How, I do not guess. <laughs> it is a fault that that springeth from your eye. For gazing on your beams, fair sun, being by. <laughs> Gaze where you should, and this will clear your sight. As good to wink, sweet love, as look on night. Oh, you, me love? Call my sister so. Thy sister's sister. That's my sister. No, it is thyself. Mine own self's better part. Mine eyes clear eye. My dear heart's dearer heart my food, my fortune, and my sweet hope's aim, my soul, earth's heaven, and my heaven's claim. All this is my sister, or else should be. Call thyself sister, sweet, for I am thee. Thee will I love, and with thee lead my life. Thou hast no husband yet, nor I no wife. Give me thy hand. Oh, sir, soft. Hold you still. Uh, I'll fetch my sister, and I'll get her goodwill. All right, thank you. <laughs> well, you showed us how you were feeling your way into and through the scene when we do it again. Uh, you'll probably want to pick up the pace a little bit. Yeah, totally. That last line and a half of Lucetta's yes. uh, expresses one of the most remarkable <laughs> changes of <laughs> mind or heart or mood in all of dramatic literature, right? Because she's been saying no, 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 no throughout, and then suddenly she says, well, I'll see what my sister thinks about it. If she <laughs> agrees, we'll go off to the Bahamas together. All right, so... Uh, uh, how do you explain, and while you're thinking about that, let's acknowledge that this play is not meant to be entirely realistic, right? Uh, Shakespeare's comedies generally aren't, certainly the early ones, and this uh, makes a good case for being the earliest play that Shakespeare wrote. We don't know exactly, but, you know, 1590, 91, so the beginning of his career. It's also distinguished by the fact that there's an unusual amount of rhyme in it. Now, we know that Shakespeare wrote mostly in uh, uh, verse. 70% mm -hmm. uh, of the whole corpus is in verse. And most of that verse is blank verse, right? Unrhymed, iambic pentameter. Right. But uh, uh, this has an unusually high count. About a quarter of the verse in this play is in rhymed verse, OK? Not all rhyming couplets, as in this scene, for example but nevertheless right. So that's a pointer towards the artifice of the situation. 
comedy expects a certain amount or allows for a certain amount of convention. Yep. But I'm not myself convinced that that is really good enough to explain what appears to be a, 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 a total character switch on behalf of, uh, on the part of Luciana. So how do you feel as playing this three-dimensional character uh, deal with it? Um, I, I think that Luciana is um, well on her way to being a spinster. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very possible that the, the, in one interpretation, you know, she'll take what she can get. Mm -hmm. um, I am a romantic, and so I like to think that it's kind of like that, that there was a ping the first time that we saw each other, mm -hmm. but that it is a, it's absolutely horrible. We should never. This is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, he wins her over with his earnest love. Uh-huh. So if you're on the way to being the maiden aunt, this you might see as your one and only opportunity sure. <laughs> to, to, yes. Uh, but of course, you're speaking the language of propriety. What, what word do I want? Propriety. Yeah. Uh, almost all the way through the speech, and then you flout all those conventions, right? You know, divorce wasn't exactly easy in 1591, so how do you actually plan this to work out is, is not so easy. All right. Um, you gave a couple of hints, physical and vocal hints, before you got to the line, which I thought was very helpful, so you didn't just uh, hit us out of the blue. I have a couple of questions about the meaning. Uh, they're actually both for you, Antipholus. You, right. you describe yourself as not mad, but mated. How, I do not know. What does mated mean there? I mean, uh, what, what I took it as in, 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 in love, um, not, not, not mad, out of my senses, but madly in, in love. Uh, fine, yes. It, it, it probably actually carries the Elizabethan meaning of being overcome by something. Okay. And presumably there's also a pun on mating in the more obvious mating. sense. Yeah. The early Shakespeare particularly is full of puns, and this is probably one example. Right. A couple of lines later, you say, she says, um, gaze where you should, and let's see if I can read this myself. And that will clear your sight. To which you respond, good. as good to wink, sweet love, as look uh, on night. What does wink mean? Well, for me, for me, it's just nothing. I mean, I mean, if, if she's the sun and Adriana is the night, I'd rather, I'd rather look at nothing than have to look at her sister. Right. But uh, wink in Elizabethan English always means to shut one's eyes, right? Not right. to blink. Right. So basically, you're saying. Um, I might as well have my eyes closed for all the beauty I can see in her. She's a kind of benighted creature. All right, I think right. otherwise the meaning is clear. Yeah. Um, now, I, I would say the main acting problem in this scene is what the non-speaker is doing <laughs> during sure. these two massive monologues. Yeah. Clearly, uh, each is neither is a soliloquy. Each is addressed to the other, right. uh, and uh, it's quite a problem in a way for the other to figure out why he or she doesn't interrupt. Um, do you have any simple answer to that, why Shakespeare doesn't allow, uh, for example, um, Antipholus to break into this uh, tirade of abuse and vice versa? Why doesn't she say to him, look, enough, I'm going inside, or get you inside? Well, I mean, I, I would say that I want to hear her, one, I want to hear her speak, but two, I want to hear her whole argument so that I can negate, I, I can clear all worries that she has. Like, uh -huh. tell me everything you don't think is going to be fine, and we're going to make it OK. <laughs> all right. um, uh, could be, could be, you know, like, cause, you know, Shakespeare is so much about argument. And I want to hear her argument right, right. so that I can then tick it off. Um, could, Just could hearing be. the sound of her voice, that sounds to me a fairly good reason. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah also. Rattle on. Right, keep, um, keep going. But what about you, uh, Luciana? Um, I, I think that I'll hear him because what he's saying is so lovely. <laughs> 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 I mean, why stop? I see. <laughs> um, so but there is a time and a place, and we need to cut it off at a certain moment. Okay. I also think that in maybe a longer rehearsal period, um, I, I would love to have worked with um, being able to like actually find the impulses for each line uh -huh. off uh -huh. of 
well, whatever it is that he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, there's something in that of like, oh, this is working. I'm going to keep going yeah. until, yeah. until right. it's not going to work, and then I'm going to have yeah. to. Well, yeah. maybe we can see a little bit more of both of those when yeah. we do it uh, again. But I like your idea, Luciana, that you don't mind the sound of his voice, <laughs> even if what he's actually saying is, uh, at least on principle, repulsive to you. Now, let, let's do a little exercise. Um, could you bring one of those chairs to center stage? All right. Now, uh, I brought along a couple of props, thinking we might find them useful, and I, I want to try them. So, uh, Luciana, would you go to the podium, uh, upstage that, <laughs> where you will find a book, if it's still there, and a shawl. <laughs> All right. Now, could you get out of the way, please, uh, Antipholus? <laughs> All right. Now, let's put the uh, shawl over your head for maiden modesty. And let's go with this notion that she is a very modest creature. In fact, let's get extreme about this. Sure. She's thinking of entering a convent. Let us think of her as a pro <laughs> I brought the largest Bible I could find. <laughs> um, it's the Catholic Bible, actually, isn't it? Anyway, think of yourself as the prototypical Isabella in measure for measure, right? So you are reading uh, Holy Scripture. Great. And you're reading it to yourself. I don't want any of the text for a minute, right? But you're t thoroughly absorbed in it. And let's assume that Antiphilus approaches from the aisle over there, right. yes, and he sees his prize, as it were, and let's assume that you do not notice him for the longest possible time, or at least you pretend not to notice him, <laughs> until he somehow or other forces himself on your attention, okay? But you're a very serious reader, and I think there's a bookmark in there, isn't there? There is. Yeah, so just, I mean, that's a convenient place. And not that you're going to read any of that out loud for the moment. All right. But, but get serious about the opening chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Right? <laughs> All right. Any time, please, uh, Antipholus. So, now let's spin a variant on that. Um, let's improvise some dialogue. We don't want the Shakespeare, but just, uh, you know, whatever comes into your head, both of you, to get some kind of dialogue going. It should be in the spirit of the scene, obviously. So, why don't you try another angle, um, Chris? Come up th down this aisle. Maybe she'll look, yes, maybe she'll look better from this side. Oh, of course. <laughs> And think about, you know, going around behind her, trying to catch her attention from all sides. Great. And you can take time to get into any speech. All right, once again. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. Walking through. Are you looking for my sister? No. What's what's that you're uh, you're reading? The Bible. Fine book. <laughs> Have you gotten to the part yet? Uh, I won't give it away. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Let me just.
right. Good. Have you quite Good. forgot a husband's office? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the idea, yeah. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> one more time. And this time, use the words of the opening chapter of Matthew to keep him at a distance. In fact, let's assume that you're mumbling them to yourself, barely audibly, when you first sense him, and then you can build the volume to drown out his real speech from Shakespeare, right? Great. So come from an aisle again, please, Chris. And sorry, are, so we're starting with my text, or she'll still say her no, text? No, starting with your text. Great. And Great. we'll have this simultaneous, right? Right. Each of you trying to ride over the other. Salmon was the father of Boaz. <laughs> Rehab being his mother, Boaz Wait, was the first. <laughs> what your name is else, okay. I know father not. Nor by what wonder you do hit of mine. David was the father of Solomon. Less than your wonder and your grace you show not than our earth's the father of wonder. Abraham. You're more than Abraham earth divine. Teach of me, of my Abraham dear creature, of how to think. Father and and see. Louder, Luciana. Drown ah. out. What? Louder. Ah. Drown him out. Teach me, dear Jonathan creature, how to father think. Of Ahad. Ahad was the father of Hezekiah. I was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amma and Messiah. But I was the father of Messiah and me. And the deportation. Great, thank you. Now, one more little experiment. I'm glad you brought that second chair in, because I'd like to try a completely different approach to the scene. Uh, the exact opposite from the way you played it first time around, and whether or not we would go with this, or perhaps more likely absorb some of it into a final version, let's try it. Now, this time, stay with the Bible, <coughs> you're reading, uh, and he sits rather modestly down next to you, and this becomes a, a really private conversation <laughs> in which you're using the Bible, the text of the Bible, to instill in him uh, the proper memory of um, faithful behavior to his wife, right? Okay? And then let's suppose that when you come back at her, you've already despaired of achieving anything, right? And are hoping against hope that she will give you uh, what you ask for. Ah, huh, okay. Um, I think we'll begin it from the beginning of the scene, though we won't finish the scene, all right? So let's take it from there. Let's have you coming in, uh, in some kind of depression, because you've given up hope. But there she is, you'll give it a shot. And you, you would like the text that I am seeing? Yeah, you know, the real text, Shakespeare's text. Great. So you are rebuking him, but rather nicely. <laughs> and in fact, since the, pretty much the last time we saw you and your sister, she told you to mind your own business. You don't know anything about marriage. You're a single woman. Keep out of it. So maybe you're feeling a little uncomfortable about actually interfering in the marriage, though, uh, with him rather than with your sister this time, right? Right. So there's a kind right. of awkwardness. Uh, from your side of things, and Sorry. a different kind of awkwardness from his, all right? Yeah. Let's try it from the top. <laughs> I 
And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office. Shall Antipholus, being in the spring of love, even in the spring of love, thy love spring is brought? Shall love in building grow so ruinous? If you did wed my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth use her with more kindness. Or if you like elsewhere, do it by stealth. Muffle your false love with some show of, of blindness. Let not my sister read it in your eye. Be thy tongue, be not thy tongue, thy own shame's orator. Look sweet. Be fair. Become disloyalty. Apparel vice like virtue's harbinger. Bear a fair presence, though your heart be tainted. Teach them the carriage of the holy saint. Be false true. But be secret false. What need she be acquainted? Alas, poor women. Uh. Make us but believe, being compact of credit, that you love us. Those others have the arm, show us the sleeve. We in your motion turn, and you may move us. Then, gentle brother, get you to my, get you to your, then, gentle brother, get you in again. Uh. Comfort my sister, cheer her, call her wife. Tis holy sport to be a little vain, and sweet breath of flattery conquers strife. Sweet mistress, oh. what your name is else I know not, <laughs> nor by what wonder you do hit of mine. Less in your wonder and your grace you show not than our earth's wonder, more than earth divine. Teach me, <gasps> dear creature, how to think and speak. Lay open to my earthy gross conceit, smothered in errors, feeble, shallow, weak, the folded meaning in your words deceit. All right, I think we can stop it there. So it's becoming the tragedy of errors now, isn't it? Right, yeah. <laughs> but of course, if you start to think about this in realistic terms, it's a pretty bad situation, yeah. right? Right. Uh, and so they're both of them playing with fire, one point or another in the scene. But you can see, I think, from what they did then, the possibilities underlying the same text and what can be done with them in a full performance. Um, could we have the house lights back on, and we'll take a little time now to answer any questions you may have, or uh, listen to your comments on uh, the scene, and then uh, the actors will do the whole thing again uh, perfectly. Perfectly. <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> so, anybody, there is a traveling mic. We can't really see hands, but if you would like to ask a question, put your hand up, and somebody will come to you. Uh, we have a hand here. Uh, I think it's for the recording, actually. Okay, give it a try. Yes, well, actually, why don't you start? Because we can always repeat the question if it's not clear. Uh, well, I'm oh, here. amazed at how well you work with it. Um, you, you kind of each picked up the nuances, one from the other. Um, so quickly, have you worked? And other things together a lot? Have you done scenes together? Have you done scenes together that would promote this kind of thing? Um, so we've been in school together now for about two years. Uh, we're starting our third year. Two years and some change. Yeah. Yeah, and actually we, we, were, um, we auditioned on the same day, too. Yeah. Like okay. our, our Saturday, like, you know, each day there's 100 people, and by the end of the day there's like five. And we were, we were in the same group there. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, yeah, we've, I mean, we've watched each other do just about anything 
you want to see and then a lot of stuff you don't want to see. Well, right. so, um, yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely shows, I think, in this because, I mean, just per the professor's instructions, you were just so easily able to know what to do. <laughs> Mm. So I found Each that class has only 16 members. It's 16 in your year, isn't 17, it? 17. 17, yes. yeah. So, you know, three years together, they okay. know probably more about one another than they ever want to know. But they, <laughs> okay. they certainly have to, you know, muscle in together and make the best of it. Yeah. Well, you did. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Uh, somebody else? Please put your hand up and the mic will come your way. <laughs> Hello, question to Professor Biggs. Uh, have you worked with this scene uh, with the actors before in preparation for this class, or is it the first run right. through? Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, we met two nights ago uh, and read through the scene, basically to make sure of, uh, you know, that we've taken care of any textual problems, because we didn't want to spend a lot of time here dealing with meaning. I know I asked two questions about meaning, which I should have asked two nights ago and didn't. Uh, we spent about half an hour doing that. Now, for all I know, the two actors may have spent some time with each other, but the idea is to come at this early on, imagining this is a microscope of the whole process of bringing a play, not just a scene, from the page to a you know, public presentation. Uh, and by the end of this hour, which is fast approaching, uh, we hope you, know, we will, you will see what can be done within an hour as a sample of what can be done over a period of four or five weeks. You also direct as part of your teaching at the Yale School of Drama? You direct no. plays at... Um, this is the only program I do with uh, drama school students. I do direct, I teach acting in Yale College, um, especially Shakespeare acting, but, uh, and I direct undergraduate productions typically every other year and with an emphasis on Shakespeare historically. I've directed, I think, 14 Shakespeare productions. Not all here, admittedly, but mostly with undergraduates. Yeah. But this is not about directing a full production. And in a way, that's nice, because it focuses entirely on what the actors are doing. You don't have to think about you know, the so-called production values, which can get in the way. And they're simply not available here to the, to the actors. I ask them to bring it, you know, to wear clothes, modern clothes, that would be roughly suitable for the situation. But that really is the only thing that goes even an inch or two beyond their acting. So uh, if you were to imagine this was going to be your production, uh, Comedy uh -huh. of Errors, how much time do the students have to actually read the play before you start uh, blocking it? If you're asking me as a director? Yes. Um, <clears throat> now, that's bound to vary according to the time available for the whole thing. Now, in recent years, the undergraduate productions that I have directed have had the luxury of a whole semester. It's built into the curriculum. Uh, and so uh, we spend you know, a lot of time uh, reading, moving it around, uh, but not setting, setting the blocking. Uh, that's a bit of a luxury. And it depends on the size, well, not so much the size of the cast, but on the number of people on stage at any one time. As anybody who's in the theater will immediately recognize, any two-person scene can sometimes be left to the actors to block differently every time within certain limits. You pretty much got to define entrances and exits. But the more people you have on stage, and the smaller the stage, the more the director has to be on the ball about getting the traffic moving uh, earlier than perhaps otherwise is desirable. You can't leave everything to chance. Now, I don't know how that squares with your experience. I mean, you were both in the As You Like It, and you've done other full productions. How long did you have uh, for those productions? And was the process similar to what I've described or not? Um, in school, it, it, uh, it varies on the project. Um, I know that thesis shows have a lot longer. Uh, is that right? Thesis Correct. shows have, have longer to rehearse. And what is a thesis show? A thesis show is um, when a director, there are three directors every year for three years. Um, and those three directors, in their final year, are given the opportunity to end the money, to, to put on a really spectacular show. 
um, something that they have created uh, of their choosing. Um, and with a thesis show, I think that you get about a month. Mm. And, like, and, and in a crazy way, 10 days for tech, which is the, the technical part of the rehearsal. Um, and that's kind of unheard of. Um, in, in the Shakespeare that we did here uh, to gents, I think that we probably had, in rehearsal, in the room, I think we had about three and a half weeks. Um, and that, and in terms of like how long do you have before, like your question was how long do you read? Yeah, like how long do you spend time absorbing the, absorbing the text? Yeah. As much as you can. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you get it a week before, you spend every second. If you get it a month before, hopefully you still spend every second. Yeah. Um, just because so much of our job relies on, relies on us being able to show up to a room and be able to play. Yeah. Um, like I, we, this summer we were both in a, the, the Yale Summer Cabaret and we had 12 day rehearsal processes which are incredibly, incredibly short. And I remember someone including said it. Including tech. Including tech, only 12 days to do a show. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's really, when it's that tight, it really boils down to like my job is to know my lines. <laughs> and like, but the thing is once I show up to rehearsal and I know my lines, my, my work is done and I can begin to play. Yeah. So I want to show up with as much of the work out of the way so I can just, I can just watch her foot and try and touch it or I can watch her flip, try and flip a page, you know, because if you're in your book, you're not going to notice what's actually happening in front of you. And our job is to uh, react and respond to what's actually happening in the room at that moment on that night, at that hour, at that minute. Um, yeah. Thank you. You have a hand here, I think. While the mic is reaching this person, um, have you understudied, uh, Ceci, at the rep? I know that Chris has. What did you understudy? Um, I got to understudy the Realistic Joneses, which is a uh -huh. Will Eno play. I got uh -huh. to understudy Johanna Day's character. Uh -huh. Did you go on? I did not. <laughs> uh, the rep season really doesn't give more than about four weeks to actual performances. Does right. It? No. But uh, Chris, you understudied uh, Hamlet. Hamlet, yeah. <laughs> Did you go on or not? I did not go on, but I knew the entire script. Oh, there I, you go. I, I learned the entire role. Um, and we have understudy rehearsals where we, all the understudies go on and basically go through the play together. Uh -huh. So I got, to, I got to play Hamlet over five days uh -huh. um, <laughs> without an audience. But, uh -huh. you know, I'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it again. You learned all 1,400 lines given to Hamlet. Yeah. You know, that's only 350 lines short of the whole of the Comedy of Errors. The whole play itself, yeah. Which is Shakespeare's shortest play. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not a theater person, but when I see a master class, I'm always shocked how with a different, uh, you can, how different it can be and how little it in, is in the words, mm -hmm. you know, or how much variety there is in the non-word part. And uh, does that feel that to you when you, like, when you do the two or three things here, does each one feel really quite different to you? Um, I think, so I think that the thing that for, the, the words are incredibly important and I think it's actually the argument that's incredibly important. And the argument will never change, regardless of how it is that I choose to attack that argument. Attack is kind of a violent word, I don't like mm -hmm. it, but, but, but how I choose to use it to my advantage. Um, and so, you know, if, if if, if he had us suspended on something and we had to swing to each other, you know, I don't know, another version, um, that would change the way that I used my argument, but the argument itself never changes. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Is that kind of weird? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and there's something in like, you know, these words were written hundreds of years ago, and uh, why are we still doing them? Because in this moment with these people, it's new, it's different. And so yeah. um, this was kind of a little microcosm of every time someone else approaches this scene, it will never be the same. And, mm. and, it's, and, and, what we're, and the miracle is that you don't have to try to make it different. Each new, I mean, he gave us new uh, given circumstances or new physical actions. And simply by doing that, I didn't have to show you a really different take on the scene. I just had to pursue the scene with whatever was given. And it all of a sudden informed. There's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole lot of freedom in, uh, in, in, in specificity. Yeah. And, 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 in, uh, and a really narrowing down, okay, this time you're looking at her left ear, and this time you're, you, you, you want to paint her with, you know, like those little silly images or 
phrases can really um, uh, transform what we're doing. Great, thank you. I have a question for you, though. Did you feel that any of the uh, exercises uh, were untrue to the script or expressions, legitimate expressions, possible expressions of the script? I, I didn't think they were untrue, which is m even more shocking to me. <laughs> that, right. that given the, the constancy of the words, right. the different approaches, and, and, and I think the, this, this sort of similarity of feeling, but also the difference at the same, yeah. same time. I mean, they're both, seem to me, both yeah, there. Yeah. Chris used a technical phrase, given circumstances, which comes out of acting theory. And it, it can mean several things. Uh, it, the given circumstances include the physical bodies and voices of the actors. They include a given script, which the assumption is you're not going to change. But then, as he was getting at, they also include suggestions uh, from a director who can replace either the physical action of the scene, or let's say that, in order to steer the actors in a slightly different direction. That's the most common use, I think, of the phrase, given circumstances. And it's critical to what any actor does. Okay? Yes. Without given circumstances, you have no idea where you are or what you're supposed to be doing, basically. Right. We have a hand uh, up front here. So I had a question about the program and not about uh, today's lecture for you guys. So um, the Yale Drama School is really famous. I'm curious how you found it to be different than what you expected. Ha. Huh. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, hmm. How did I? It, it was, a, it, yeah, it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, I didn't, they were like, it's really hard, you're not going to sleep a lot, and I'm like, yeah. Oh, they did, were not kidding. Mm -hmm. They weren't joking. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sick right now, <laughs> actually. Uh, I tried to stay up last night learning lines and also doing the rest of my homework, and it was, I think I might have gone to sleep at four. Um, that, I mean, and that's silly, like, bleh, whatever, who cares? Go to, like, it's sleep. But, um, I think that the other thing that I wasn't expecting was how incredibly talented the people that I work with are, um, how in love with their jobs our faculty is. They are like, they are so passionate and they're so amazing and, and it's such a great thing to learn from because, you know, I, I kind of came from a small community of theater and everyone there was pretty jaded. Um, and these people were so alive with it. And it's, it changes everything. When you love your job, it changes everything. Um, and also, I think that the other things that, that I thought, you know, I thought that I was going to leave here and, like, I was going to get the acting secret. Like, they were going to teach me the secret. There's no secret. And that was so disappointing. <laughs> it's, just, it's just working. You just work and keep working and working. Oh. That's it. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of Sartre's play, No Exit. <laughs> 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 Trying to get uh, drama school people to do anything outside their curriculum is not easy. So I'm particularly grateful to these two. And I had no idea, I had no idea, that you weren't feeling well. Oh, that's it okay. didn't show. Uh, Chris, how, how, how would you respond? Each of you, of course, spent time out before yeah. coming here. Cool. It's unusual, not uh, unique but unusual for somebody to be accepted in the drama school, at least the acting program, uh, straight out of college. And you, I would think, are probably closer to the average. You did yeah. five years and you did two years, I two think. Years. Yeah. Um, so that's really a second question. Why, after this experience in the real professional world, did you want to go back to school? Wasn't that a regression? Ooh. Well, so so I'll, I'll answer that question first, and maybe tie in this 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 thing. So I was in New York, and uh, I was seeing these great actors work, and I noticed that they had gone to graduate school, um, and uh, I, uh, I I auditioned without knowing that I wanted to come. I just auditioned to see what the opportunity would present. And when I got in, I realized that it was um, I realized that putting my ego aside, I I, I just I want to work, and it's three years of work. You know, for me, it's not a regression. For me, it's three years of working with the best people that I've ever met um, on amazing plays with, uh, with professors who care and are able to push me further than I can push myself sometimes. So in that respect, I think I kind of won, you know? <laughs> I mean, 
I mean, this doesn't exist, and I, I, I know it, and this isn't the real world. This is a really great uh, Petri dish that kind of gets to jumpstart a lot of things in which I'll hopefully work on for the rest of my life when I, when I have a life. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and, I, and I think what's been so surprising about this, this program is how, is how personal it feels. Um, I don't feel like I'm going to the Yale School of Drama. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I feel like, I feel like, uh, I feel like I'm, I don't feel like I'm going to therapy, but I, <laughs> but 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 I do feel I do feel personal relationships to the lessons that we're learning, the people who are here, and to the institution. It, it's 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 no longer an institution to me, um, and that was really surprising that it, this wasn't a place I was going to go to, and you know, and get beat up by, and yeah. come out looking like looking castable. Um, this is a place that has really I think I think it, I think this place changes depending on who's here. I think the school actually changes itself to accommodate the students and the faculty that are here, and that's been awesome to be a part of, to be a part of making this place what it is. And I hope you agree that a lot of the credit for what you have enjoyed is due to the dean of the school and artistic oh, yeah. director of the Yale Rep, James Bundy. Uh, time for maybe one more question. I think you have a hand there. Oh, you have a hand back there, and then maybe we could go across the room and finish with that. Yeah. Uh, I thought that person is closer. This is probably a little out in left field, but I'm just curious about, um, particularly Maury Briggs, what your take is on the Josh Whedon "Much Ado About Nothing," <laughs> which is, I think, shot uh, under in you know in a very short period of uh -huh. time, and uh -huh. yet is very accessible <laughs> Shakespeare sure. and stars an ex Yale student. I mean, in right. one of the roles. Well, um, <clears throat> the actor playing Claudio, Fran Kranz, yeah. was uh, in my acting class when he was here, and we stayed in touch and we've become friends. He was barricading me with emails during the late summer. What do you think of Much Ado About Nothing? I'm dying for an opinion. Well, it didn't show publicly in New Haven, and the DVD came out three days ago, right? <gasps> So I have an excuse for not having seen it yet. But as soon as it gets into the Film Study Center, I have a special order for it. I will see it, and I will report at least to one of the actors on it. But uh, the, the word about it not is very good. Uh, and you know, Fran has a history with uh, Joss Whedon. He was in the Dollhouse TV series together, and was last seen, of course, on Broadway in the uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman um, Death of a Salesman. So, and he was very happy with the experience. So, uh, maybe we should move to another question. <laughs> yes. And this will be it, and then we'll run the scene again while you're still here. Yeah. Um, I again just like to get back to to the play. Um, what's not delineated. Um, in this, in the way you perform, for obvious reasons, is the location. Where is this encounter taking place? Um, it could have actually been in a chapel, in which case, um, you know, he comes upon her in a chapel because he's so depressed, or um, out in a garden, or in one of the rooms. Um, and how would the, the location impact? on um, the kind of encounter that takes place between them. Yeah. Um, I, the, the location is enormous, and I think that the, the difference between a garden and a room, I mean, the moment that Chris shut the door, uh, it changed the space. You know, it suddenly becomes a lot more dangerous. Um, it, so Shakespeare doesn't really tell us, other than in the text. He doesn't have stage directions. That like actually isn't true. Those were written in by editors. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of have to make it up. Yeah, uh, I think that the obvious it's thought is, house. yeah, yeah the, it's definitely at our house because we've had we've been having mm -hmm. dinner, um, but we're away from Adriana, so I, I don't know, like in another room, probably. Mm -hmm. And then we would like right. make it more specific, right. um, like maybe the garden would be lovely. It's very romantic. There's like a, a garden <laughs> in the back of the house. Yeah, the scene before this takes place outside of 
this house or outside of Adriana's house with my twin banging and saying, let me in, and them saying, you're crazy, you're already here. Um, <laughs> what's wrong with you? So, so I, I mean, yeah, and, and the text doesn't say clearly, but I would assume this is in Adriana, Adriana's house where, where Luciana also lives and well, we're now my house, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, set design is, is, is a whole other element that informs so much and that the director really gets to choose how much they wanted to be a part of it. How, you know, a lot of Shakespeare's done with just empty, empty spaces. We just saw a production of McBee, um, the Scottish play oh. at a, this isn't really a theater, uh, Macbeth at, the, uh, at, at Hartford stage. Um, uh, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it was completely blank. It's just a thrust without any set. And they did the whole play. It was beautiful. Um, so it's possible to go to nothing, and it's possible to have levers and drawers and setting a table and throwing plates on the ground and, you know. That's fun. That's fun, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, I, thank you. I think we have time to see the whole scene once again. Um, you have a choice whether to use furniture or not, um, but you're not to use scripts this time. Throw them to the wind. That's my choice. Do you want me to hold one just in case? I think I need to hold mine just in case. We're just gonna we're gonna hold them, but we're not gonna use them. <laughs> and may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office. Shall Antiphilus even in the spring of love, thy love springs rot. Can love, in building, grow so ruinous? If you did wed my sister for her wealth, then for her wealth's sake, use her with more kindness. Ugh. Or, if you like elsewhere, do it by stealth. Muffle, muffle your false love with some show of blindness. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, uh. Let, let not my sister read it in your eye. Let not thy tongue be thy own shame's orator. Look sweet, be fair, become disloyalty. <laughs> Apparel vice, like virtue's harbinger. Bear fair presence, though your heart is tainted. <gasps> Teach them the carriage of a holy saint. Be secret false. What, what need she be acquainted? Oh, alas, poor women! <sighs> Make us but believe, being compact of credit, that y you love us. <laughs> Though others have the arm, you show us the sleeve. We, in your motion, turn, and y you may move us. Then, gentle brother, get you in again. Comfort my sister, cheer her, call her wife. <gasps> Tis holy sport to be a little vain. One sweet breath of flattery. Comfort strife. Sweet mistress! You. Oh, what your name is else I know not, nor by what wonder you do hate of mine. Less in your wonder and your grace you show not than our earth's wonder, more than earth divine. Teach me, dear creature, how to think and speak. Lay open to my earthy gross conceit, ah, smothered in errors, feeble, shallow, weak, the hidden meaning of your words deceit against my soul's pure truth. Why labor you to make it wander in an unknown field? Are you a god? Would you create me new? Transform me then, and to your power I'll yield. But if that I am I, <laughs> then well I know your weeping sister is no wife of mine, nor to her bed no homage do I owe. Far more, far more to you do I decline. Oh, train me not, <gasps> sweet mermaid, 
with thy note to drown me in thy sister's flood of tears. Sing, siren, for thyself, and I will dote. Spread o'er the silver waves thy golden hairs, and as a bed I'll take them there and lie. <gasps> and in that glorious supposition think he gains by death that hath such means to die. Let love, being light, be drowned if she sink. Are you mad that you do reason thus? Not mad, but mated. How, I do not guess. Uh, uh, oh. It is a fault that springeth from your eye. For gazing on your beams, fair sun being by. Gaze upon my sister. Gaze where you should, and that will clear your sight. As good to wink, sweet love, as look on night. Why call you me love? Call my sister so. Thy sister's sister. That's my sister. No, 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 it is thyself. Mine own self's better part, mine eyes clear eye, my dear heart's dearer heart, my food, my fortune, my sweet hope's aim, my soul earth's heaven, and my heaven's claim. All this my sister is, or else should be. Oh, myself, sister sweet. For I am thee, thee will I love, and with thee lead my life. Thou hast no husband, yet nor I no wife. Go to my sister and get her goodwill. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.